Okay, so I'm going to share with you a few things. So here's a little background. Here's the background. So last year, many of you know I had some challenges in my health, and it was a very unusual year. It was a different year than I've ever had. And during that year, one of the scriptures that I kept hearing the Lord say to me was from John chapter 15, and it's John chapter 15 in verse number 2, and I'll read it to you here. This is from the King James. John chapter 15 in verse number 2, Jesus said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. So in the course of that season of my life, I spent a lot of time praying going, Lord, this is, a, this is so odd because in many respects, the preceding year had been the most fruitful year of ministry I'd ever had in my life. There were doors that opened up, there were things that happened, and it was the most fruitful year of my ministry. And then when I came into the new year immediately, you know, I went through this season of great testing and as I would wait on the Lord, this passage would just keep coming to me. And that was, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it might bring forth more fruit. And so, of course, I know God's not our problem. God's not the author of sickness and disease. Um, I realize that. But in the midst of this, it was like the Lord was saying, Tom, you're going to come out of this, and you're either going to come out better than you went into it. And he kept giving me the illustration of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that at the, after they came out of the fiery furnace, they really were blessed. And the reality is we'd probably never have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had they not gone through that season of putting God first in that trial. So I came to the end of that, and this would be about somewhere around uh, May of last year. And I was just praying one morning. I said, Lord, what do I do now? That was my prayer. Lord, what am I supposed to do now? I've gone through this season. What are you saying to me now? And I heard the Lord say, as clear as a bell, we say, clear as can be, the Lord said to me, get in my word. Now, when I heard that, I thought, my Lord, that's all I've done for the last four months here. But the Lord made it so clear, this is what you do for the rest of your life. You're going to spend more time in my word than ever before. So I have been very diligent to do that. I mean, I was reminded of a Baptist pastor down in Dallas for many years, over 50 years, W.A. Criswell, and he used to travel around and he would tell pastors, give your mornings to God. That's what his whole theme was. Give your mornings to God. Make sure, pastors, that you're feeding yourself before you feed anybody else. And, and so for me, that, the Lord put that on my heart. Give your morning to me. Spend more time with me. And so I've really protected that. It's really been a change for our schedule, Sharon and I's schedule, but I knew the Lord was saying, that's what you need to do, and you'll ultimately be fr more fruitful in this. So a lot of times on a Sunday, by the time I get up here to preach, I'm just overflowing. <laughs> so I'm just like going nine to nothing because there's just so much in me from this time that I've waited on the Lord. And then previous to that, I was waiting on the Lord one time, and I just felt like the Lord reminded me of a scripture that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, in the NIV, and it says this, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, NIV, and the Lord was saying, Tom, you need to go into strict training. This predated all of this that went on. And it was like, you need to go into strict training. You need to go into strict training. And, I mean, I've always been a stickler for the Word. I've always had devotional times. Always, at that time, I had my alarm set for 5.30. I'm getting up. I'm doing everything, I, you know, I know. But I knew the Lord was saying, you need to get in more. And so, so anyway, I'm praying this week. I got up, you know, early. i just laying there, worshiping the Lord, praying. And I was thinking, it was Thursday morning, and I was thinking, okay, i gotta, I got to get my devotion time in. i got to get this study time in, get in my word. I'm, I'm making that my mission for the rest of my life more than I've ever dreamed of in the past. In fact, I don't even know pastors that do this. And I'm like, this is what I know I'm called to do. And so I'm, I hear the Lord say that, you know, get in, get in my word. And so early Thursday morning, I'm thinking, I'm laying there thinking, okay, I need to do this. I need to study this, study this. And then I heard the Lord say something. And this is... A game changer. This is a paradigm shift. You know what I'm saying? 
That means a way that you're going to think different for the rest of your life. And I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, enjoy me. That's all he said. Enjoy me. Now, I'm going to stop and say this. You know, we don't study theology as an end into itself. We study theology that we can enjoy the knowledge of God more. We don't study the Greek and the Hebrew as an end in of itself. We love studying these Greek words. We love studying Hebrew backgrounds. But we're not studying as an end of itself. We're studying this ultimately that we can know God more. So the goal of every Christian is to know him and to enjoy him. And of course, once I heard the Lord say, enjoy me, I was reminded of this catechism, Westminster Catechism from the 1600s. And many of you are familiar with it. And it says, ask the question, what is the chief duty of man? And then that got revised. What is the chief end of man? And the chief end of man is this, is simply to what? Glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So what is the ultimate desire of Christendom? Is that we would live our lives in a way where we glorify God and that we would enjoy him forever. Now, do you understand God doesn't want us to view heaven as heaven is this place where we're going to eternally enjoy God. But now we're not doing that now, but when we get to heaven, we're going to do that. Now, I want to tell you this, y'all. We're supposed to enjoy right now. We're supposed to enjoy the Lord. We're supposed to truly enjoy his presence. Now, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. Go over to Psalm 100. Psalm 100 in verse number one, Psalm 100 in verse one, number one says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And notice this statement. Serve the Lord with what? Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God, and he has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting. But notice the scripture says that we're to make joyful noises to the Lord. A joyful noise. Did you know church is to be a place of joy. Christianity, when the Ethiopian, let me say it this way, Christianity is to be really a faith that's filled with joy. When the Ethiopian eunuch received the Lord, the Bible says he just went on his way rejoicing. He, he had had an encounter with God. We need to enjoy the Lord. Now, let me say this. Not everything you do in life is enjoyable. I got some nods on that one. I got some people going, oh, yeah, you, you, you're, you're, you're right on, Pastor. But did you know everywhere you go, God goes, and even when you're doing things that are not enjoyable in and of themselves, you can enjoy the presence of God. You can just learn God is. You're with me. So the last few days, I've just been meditating on this. Enjoy me, Tom. Enjoy me. Well, we think about life. You know, marriage isn't just, I'm in a covenant with Sharon. That shouldn't be, well, who are, I'm in covenant with Sharon. Well, yeah, I am in covenant with Sharon. But you know, God really wants you to enjoy marriage. Okay, this is a revelation. Not only are we called to be married, but we're called to enjoy marriage. Yeah. How many know God did not give marriage because, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to put it on them? God gave you marriage because, you know what, two would be better than one. And I want to bless people. I want them to know what it's like to have a, a healthy relationship. So marriage was designed not just from a legal covenant relationship. That's part of it, but there's another part of it is God wants it to be relational. God wants it to be fulfilling. God wants it to be joyful. He turned the water into wine at a marriage feast. It's a picture of a domestic miracle. God wants to bring joy into 
uh, marriages. And God doesn't just want us to serve him. Well, I'm serving. What are you doing? I'm serving down at the church. Well, that's part of what you're doing. But you're not just serving at the church. You're serving the Lord with gladness. Yeah, I'm glad about it. Oh, uh, they're, asking, they're asking for my money. Well, you know what? It's a joy to be able to give to the Lord. The Bible talks about, you know, it, God wants us to be cheerful givers. And he'll take you from a grouch, but, you know, he wants us to be cheerful givers. He wants us to be cheerful in our giving. So really, I guess my question this morning is, are you really enjoying God? Are you really enjoying your relationship with God? Now somebody can say, oh, I'm a seed of Abraham, I'm the righteousness of God, I'm new creation in Christ Jesus. I want you to confess all of that, but at the end of it, I do want you to also say, and I just love God, and it's a great thing to worship the Lord. Now, here's what I've discovered. When people aren't enjoying God, they're going to find something to enjoy in life. And the Bible talks about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11 that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And so there is sin that has a seasonal joy. And when you get born again, that season's real short. You realize that? Because the new created human spirit, it doesn't enjoy sin. Because you, you realize, no, this isn't, this isn't working in me. And so what happens is, is that when we come to know the Lord, we need to realize, whatever I do, I need to do it unto the Lord, and I need to do it with joy in my heart. Now, here's what I promise you. It's an attitude adjustment. It's a mindset. You can have two people doing the same thing, both of them, it's not very pleasurable and very enjoyable, but one of them, because they're doing it unto the Lord, there's joy in that. Okay. Yesterday, Sharon came to me and she goes, hey, I need you to do something. And I said, what is it? I need you to clean the windows on the outside. You're tall, you can get out there and get them and all that. Now, most men, when they hear that, they're not going, oh, praise God. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I was just like, okay. You know, you don't say, you just go, oh, sure, yeah, I can do that. Inside, you're going, I don't want to do that, but I'll do that. And so anyway, I go out, and I thought, now, wait a minute. Did you know I can enjoy God even when you're doing something that's not very enjoyable? Did you know God doesn't leave us like when we're doing unpleasant? He doesn't oh, you're gone. You're so low now. I'm, I'm out of here. No, the Holy Spirit comes to abide with us forever. He wants to know, hey, I'm in there just as much. I'm in your life just as much during the, the unpleasurable seasons as I am the pleasurable seasons of your life. He's there with us. So, you know, yesterday as I was outside working, I was just on purpose going, Lord, I'm going to enjoy you. Now, how do we enjoy God? Well, you worship the Lord. Just being conscious of his presence. Just being alert to his spirit. And, and Lord, I, I just want to fellowship with you. I think of whatever in the Old Testament, there's a passage where God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 14. And it says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you. Did you know your pre the presence of God goes with you to work? He goes with you to home. You're going to leave church today, but you're not leaving God's presence. A corporate presence, yes, but good news, he's in us. And wherever you go, he goes, and, and you're able to just take that presence with you. So I'm just, this morning, I just felt stirred up to talk about the importance of us enjoying God. Now you say, what's some practical ways? Well, I'd say this, enjoy God in your Bible reading. Pastor, I got to get these chapters knocked out. Well, you got, you know... Uh, <laughs> 
Thank you. Pastor, I can't enjoy reading the Bible because, see, I've got to get all this stuff done because, see, I'm on this reading plan, and if I don't get this done, I'm going to fall behind. I want you to have discipline in your life. But you know what the most important thing is? Is that you're spending time with God. And I believe you need to have some structure. You need to have some discipline. Just like when it comes to any other thing in your life, you need to have discipline. You need to have discipline. What you know, Getting up at a certain time, going to bed at a certain time. It'll just help you to be more fruitful in life. But I want to say this, you know, sometimes what we do is, is we take something like reading the Bible instead of it just being, you know, Lord, I look forward to this. This is the bread of life. This is meat. The words that I speak unto you, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. Well, when we go out to a nice restaurant, Sharon and I go, oh, I, I, I dread the food coming. No, we look forward to the food coming. Well, it's the same thing with God's word. God's word is life to us. Man does not live by bread alone. And so we approach it from the standpoint, Lord, I look forward to this. I just want to spend time with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to enjoy. So enjoy your time in God's word. Can I say this? Enjoy coming to church. Yeah. Enjoy. I get in fellowship with one another. Worshiping God or church life is not just about this vertical interaction you have with God. It is also about the horizontal interaction. It is about fellowshipping with other people. It's about learning people's names and getting to know people. You see, these are the people that God at this season of your life has put around you because iron will sharpen iron and, and you will be strengthened by the interaction and the fellowship that you have with other believers. Enjoy church life. You know, people just can get the wrong mindset about going to church. You know, that's why church life needs to be drama-free. Do you run church needs to be drama-free? You know, we have a welcome class, and when we wrap up this class, I've said this for probably 15 years, I, I, I always end the class and say, you know, we have a lot of peace in this church, and I'd like to keep it that way. I do. All of you that have been in that class, you know, I remember him saying that. Well, I, I say it. We got a lot of peace in here, and I'd like to keep it that way. Uh, you know, church doesn't need to be drama filled, it needs to be Holy Ghost filled. It needs to be the presence of God filled, it needs to be anointed by the Spirit of God. That's what God wants. Church should really be the high point of your week. It shouldn't be just all we got to do. No, we get to do this. To be able to interact with other people that are on the same page with you spiritually, that's not a downer. That's a plus. That's a benefit. And when you go into Central Europe and you see how much those believers value fellowship, when they're living in such secular communities and they're living around people that are, uh, you know, so pagan in their worldview and they get around other people that are like-minded it's like oh we enjoyed this fellowship for there is not like 30 minutes it's like hours why because it's like this is special to us this is very precious to us well we need to value that church life needs to be something that we enjoy now i've touched on this but let me tell you another thing you need to enjoy enjoy giving to god oh i gotta give no we get to give Thank God we got something to give. I mean, you got something to give. And, and, you know, it's a joy to be in a position to where we're able to give. God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because, see, God himself is a cheerful giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. When you love, you give. And God wants us to be givers, forgivers. Our whole life is filled with a desire to bless. And so we need to look for ways. And we need to not just, you know, have our budget set up where we have maxed out every single bit of discretionary income. We have 100% of all the income that we earn. We have maxed it all out. We have no giving margins. 
That's not the way God wants you to live. God wants you to have some margins in there. And you say, Pastor, well, I don't know how that can happen. Did you know God knows how that can happen? In fact, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, he'll give seed to sowers. God can open up a whole other stream of income to you that you don't even see right now. So, well, I don't understand how God could do that. God can do that. God can open up another stream. I, I'm just, I feel like I need to put it up and park and just sit there for a moment. I want everybody to say, God can open up a new stream of income for me. He can. I don't think, I don't think a friend of mine would mind me telling you this. It's a testimony. But I just mentioned him, Clarence Richburg. Clarence is in his 80s. Clarence was in the Air Force years ago. And somebody told him, Clarence, you need to go down and have your hearing checked down at the VA. You need to have a hearing test. And he said, well, okay. I, you know, it's many years ago I served. And he says, you need to have your hearing checked. So he goes down to the VA. They do a hearing check on him. They check him out, and they discovered he's got a lot of hearing loss. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to send you a check for $6,000 to buy some hearing aids. And then on top of that, we're going to give you every month and it's a, it's a pretty significant amount of money. Let's put it this way, it's more than 1000 And they said this will be compensation for the, all that hearing loss. And, you know, that was a stream of income that he never even thought of. Would it offend you if God wanted to open up a new stream for you of income in your life? So I don't know how God could do that. Well, God's bigger than your three-pound brain. And he's got ways of doing things. So what am I saying to you? People, we need to be cheerful in our giving and don't spend. I've got everything maxed out. There are no margins. No, you want to not live on 100%. You want to live below 100%. So you got some margin in there. You need to tithe. But you also need to have margin in there so you're able to be a blessing. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands. This is the Apostle Paul to Ephesus. He said, but let, rather let him work with his hands that he might have to give to him that is in need. Amen. So part of the work is not solely you know, self-consumption, but it's that I can be a blessing. Now, what's another thing you need to enjoy? Y'all ready for this? Enjoy your work. Amen. Oh, Pastor. <laughs> when I hit that time clock, that, 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 the joy stops and then it resumes when I hit it again. Y'all, you, know. you got to learn. You're going to spend so much of your waking hour working. You can't just forfeit that part of your life. you got to realize, if God put me here, he didn't put me here to be miserable. He wants me to enjoy it. Amen. And you say, oh, Pastor, I don't know how I can do that. I, I just can't do that. God's grace is sufficient for you, and if you're not where you can enjoy it, God can put you somewhere where there can be joy in the journey. Enjoy it. And you say there's parts. Everybody has parts of their jobs they don't enjoy. But y'all, there is no testament to the grace of God if I can only have joy if everything is optimum, everything is optimal in my life, everything is perfect, then I've got joy. Y'all, anybody can do that. The world can do that. But for us as believers, it's less than ideal. It's not the most optimal. But guess what? God is with me and he gives me... <laughs> I'm preaching faster than I can think. He gives us joy. He gives us joy. Enjoy the journey. I'm going to go back to marriage. That went over so well, I'm going to go back on that a little bit. I love my spouse. Do you, are you in love with your spouse? Do you thank God for your spouse? You say, thank God I didn't marry somebody else. I married you. Somebody said, I had never said that. <laughs> you need to enjoy marriage. See, I, get advantage, I have an advantage you don't have. 
You know what that is? I've officiated probably about, a, I don't know, well over 100, probably close to 150 funerals. See, I have an up on you. Because, see, I go to funeral services and I see family members that have to look at a, a casket and they've, they've lost their loved one. They've lost their parent. They've lost their spouse. They've lost uh, some significant family member. And they're, they're realizing, you know, dad's gone or mom's gone. Or, and so I sit in those services and sometimes I don't really know that family that well. But I look at that and I go home and I realize whether I'm conscious of it or not, I'm living in the good old days. Amen. You are. Oh, Pastor, when we get this house paid off, it'll be the good old days. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You're in them right now. Oh, when we get this taken care of, it'll be the good old days. You're in the good old days right now. And so what you need to realize is that relationships matter. Family matters. Your marriage matters. Yeah, we had a fellow years ago preach at the church and he made this statement, and it stuck with me, and his name is Joe McGee, and he said, let me tell you something. Those kids, they're just passing through, but your marriage is permanent. Those kids, they're passing through. And he said that, and, you know, he probably, he just hit on that and moved on and talked about something else. That statement stuck with me. Now, I thank God for our kids, and we tell our kids all the time, we love you. And we, we're, it's a joy of our life to be your parents. We love them so much. It's a joy to be their parents. But I want you to know, God set it up. Marriage is to be a blessing to you. Well, I don't like the way my marriage is going. If the grass is greener on the other side... You need to water your yard. Ah, <laughs> oh, the grass is greener. I got to looking at this old. I know you say, Pastor, are you trying to be funny? I'm really not. I'm just trying to help people. Amen. You know, the Bible talks about eyes full of adultery. And people get to looking around here and looking around here. You need to also read Hebrews 13 where it says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And he's writing it to Christians. I mean, tell you, I have seen people mess their whole lives up by getting into weird relationships. And if you get around, oh, I'm starting to have weird feelings towards this person. Well, I'm telling you, that's not the Holy Spirit. And you need to shut it off and stop sin where it starts. And it starts right up here in the thought life. And you need to make sure that your spouse is the object of your affection. Enjoy your, rela- enjoy your marriage. You know, just what, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I did a funeral service. 54-year-old man, West Niles virus, right here in the city of Yukon, passed away. And I was sitting there just looking at him the family, all they went through. I thought, wow, you know, this is, people don't realize it, but they can take things for granted. You know, he came in for one night, he says, the mosquitoes are out tonight. Mosquitoes are really out tonight. Now, he had some other health problems going on, but he said, you know, they're really out tonight. And uh, and that was the beginning of that. Started, got a fever up to 107. He passed off into eternity. Now, I'm not saying that to in any way put fear on anybody, but I'm just saying that, y'all, please realize the grass is greener than you think it is right now. And enjoy the journey. Okay, so how do we enjoy life? It's not always that I'm doing something that's enjoyable, therefore I'm going to enjoy life. Most of life is mundane. Most of life is routine. Most of life is not always high fives. It's not always doing a victory lap with the flag outside the window. I mean, a lot of life is just going through life and enjoying every single step of the way. Serve the Lord with gladness. Can I get an amen on this? It's funny because I've run out of notes. (laughs) Well, study yourself full, preach yourself happy. I am full and I'm happy right now. 
And I just want you to know that that was the word that God gave me Thursday morning. Enjoy your life. In fact, I told Sharon, we went out to lunch that day. I said, I heard from the Lord, and this will be a changer. Even in my study in the word, and that's what I was referring to, is Tom, don't dread like that. For me, that's my life work. Don't, I mean, I don't dread it. I love doing it, but yet it can be a weight on me. And it was just like, hey, just enjoy it. Y'all, if you volunteer at the church, start enjoying it. Whatever you're doing. I got these little kids. Enjoy them. Oh, they're driving me nuts. Enjoy them. You know, you've heard that statement about dogs or cats, pets at the home. The statement is this. It's only part of your life, but for that animal, it's their whole life. In other words, you know, I've had dogs as a kid. I've gone through probably five, six dogs in my life. But for the dog we have now, that's his whole life. Now you say, what's the parallel? For the kids that you have in your home right now, that's their whole upbringing. It's a season of your life, but for them, it's their whole upbringing. And that's what they're going to get a lot of their worldview. That's the way they're going to shape a lot of their ideology about the future. So it's really important that you realize, I want to pour into them. And the attitudes that you have are going to be the attitudes they have. If you enjoy church life, I promise you, they're going to enjoy church life. If you don't, they're not. In other words, you're reproducing yourself, not just physically, but you're reproducing yourself in terms of values, in terms of ideology, in, the, in this terms of worldview. So, enjoy God. Okay, now here's a little revelation. I've discovered that people that are enjoying God smile more than those who aren't enjoying God. You know what we do if we're not careful? We just kind of go through life and we're not, we're just caught up in a task, but we're not caught up in the Savior. We're just caught up in this preoccupied with this, that, and the other. But hey, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, I'm doing this unto the Lord today. Praise God. Hallelujah. I got to tell you one funny story. It was a shifter for me. This was 17 years ago. 16 years ago is actually what it was. 16 years ago, we had a missionary came through town, and I knew him through another couple, and he said, look, we've got this family. They're just coming through from the U This is their first trip to the U.S. from Mexico. We're going up, I think, into Kansas to minister in a church. I heard about you through a person, kind of a mutual friend. This couple's coming in. Um, they'll just be here like for a night, and then they're going to Kansas. Would you, would you all be available to host them, to have them in your home? I can vouch for them. They're a good couple, Mexican couple, with a little baby. And, uh, you know, I was at home working that day, and I, got, I began to think about all of this. And the scripture says, offer hospitality without grumbling. And in my mind, the word hospi hospitality means a lover of strangers. And it was like I was starting to feel this weight of doing this and doing that. And it was just like I was outside working one day, and the Lord made it perfectly clear. Tom, do it unto me. How many know really our money is his money? That's what he said. It's my money. And it was like, okay. I tell you what, I took that couple out. We took them to the best barbecue place in town. We put a big platter in front of the wife, and when she started to eat it, she, this is what she said through the interpreter. She said, they killed the whole cow. <laughs> I still remember that. We fed them. We put them in our home. We fixed up that front bedroom, and we, we made it special. To, we, we just made it special because, see, it was just a little shift in my mind. I'm not doing this unto man. I'm doing this unto God. Y'all, would you enjoy life more if we knew, I'm doing this, Lord, I'm doing this unto you? Praise God. If we're going to enjoy him through eternity, we need to enjoy him now. 
So, Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I just thank you, Father God, for helping us to make this little shift in our thoughts. And that is, Lord, we're going to enjoy you. We study, we serve, we give, we fast, we pray, we do all the things that we do. But, Lord, every bit of it, we serve you with gladness in all of it, Father. And Lord, we love you so much. We thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, we just praise you today. We bless you today, Father. Lord, we glorify your name. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to stand up. Would you do that? I want everybody to stand. I want you to just make a little change in your mind right now. And that is, I want you to realize, you know what? this grouchy spirit, I'm getting it out of me. I'm going to start enjoying the journey. I'm going to enjoy my relationship with God. Praise God from sincere heart.